I am Dr. Jeffrey Long. I am a professor of religion, philosophy, and Asian studies at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. My specialization is the religions and philosophies of India. And uh, I've recently co-edited a book on nonviolence in the world's religions. And that's, and maybe I could, I'm wondering in the beginning, how did you, how did that project come to be? Why, why was nonviolence an interesting theme for you for a book? Okay, very good. So uh, nonviolence is something I've been interested in for a very long time. Uh, I'm a big believer in the idea that uh, we human beings need to find a more peaceful way to resolve our differences if life on earth is going to continue. Uh, We have developed the capacity to destroy all life, and if we're not careful, we'll do it. Uh, So I think that it's very important for us to find more peaceful ways to resolve conflict than warfare, uh, than the kinds of conflict that that we uh, have so often uh, have marked our human history. And because I'm committed to that, it's it's led me down a a great variety of different pathways. Uh, I, uh, at a very early age, I saw the movie Gandhi when uh, it came out, uh, Sir Richard Attenborough's famous film, Gandhi, which won a lot of Academy Awards. And I was 13 when that came out. So uh, if anyone wants to do the math, I'm 53. (laughs) (laughs) I was 13 when that came out. And that really made a huge impression on me. I was very taken with the idea that you could use peaceful means to to resolve conflicts, even against armed and violent uh, opponents. Uh, At least in some cases, uh, it seems that that's possible to do. Yeah. So I uh, was very uh, taken with that idea. I still, I still believe that's the best way for us to resolve our conflicts. And uh, so uh, I had a lot of other interests uh, as well that besides uh, Gandhi that drew me toward the study of, of Indian spiritual traditions. And uh, nonviolence is really central to most of them. Uh, if you look at the Hindu tradition, you look at the Jain tradition, which is less well known, but it's probably uh, the one that takes the idea of nonviolence to its furthest extent. Uh, Buddhism, of course, uh, there's a, it's very central. And really, if you look in, in uh, all traditions, it, it's somewhere, right? Christianity talks about uh, you know, not killing, uh, turning the other cheek, uh, and so on, uh, that really, if we're going to have a future love, peace, nonviolence, this is really the way to go. And as good fortune would have it, I ended up uh, over 20 years ago, I I went on the job market for my first full-time job after finishing my PhD, or as I was finishing my PhD. And I was hired here at Elizabethtown College, which has a very interesting heritage. Uh, It's uh, probably not a very famous college. Uh, I don't know how many listeners are familiar with it, but it's in rural Pennsylvania in Mm -hmm. Lancaster County. And uh, Lancaster County's big claim to fame is the Amish community. And uh, in fact, a large number of groups emigrated uh, here to Pennsylvania in the 18th century uh, from what are now called the peace churches. So you have the Amish, the Mennonites, uh, the Quakers, of course, William Penn, who established the state of Pennsylvania, was a Quaker. And then uh, uh, another member of that group is a church called the Church of the Brethren, and they started Elizabethtown College. So Elizabethtown College has long had uh, a peace and nonviolence focus in its curriculum. I mean, we're a college like every other college. You students come here to study business and, you know, biology and, (laughs) you know, whatever, you know, whatever they want to to do to get a job. Uh, But we, uh, for many years, had uh, a a minor in peace and conflict studies. We unfortunately don't have it anymore. Maybe it'll come back again. But I had a colleague uh, who coincidentally has the same last name as me. Uh, that's Mike Long, uh, Michael Long. And uh, we say coincidentally, because as far as we, we, he and I have both sort of done the research and it doesn't <laughs> appear that we're related. So okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there are German Longs and Irish Longs in America and I'm from the Irish branch and he's from the German branch. So um, you know, his ancestors probably spelled it L-A-N-G at some point. Uh, but uh he he uh, was the head of our peace and conflict studies program, and uh, he actually initially received an invitation from Rutledge, uh, which is a pretty well-known uh, academic publisher, uh, and they asked him if he would be interested in editing a volume on religion and nonviolence. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, in fact, he was teaching a course of that same name at the time. And he was, uh, uh, he was interested in it, but uh, he wanted to involve me as well, uh, because I have uh, interests along these lines. And what we were envisioning was nonviolence in the world's religions. And he has contacts and he knows people within the Abrahamic traditions. He contacted scholars of Judaism, Buddhism, Islam uh, to write their respective chapters in the book. But I'm the person who knows uh, the Jainism people, the Buddhism people, the, the, the Sikh tradition people. Yeah. And then I wrote the Hinduism chapter myself. And uh, then uh, he also uh, contacted a really outstanding uh, scholar of religion named Mark Jurgensmeyer, who is well known for his book on books on religion and violence. Uh, he has a very um, good book called Terror in the Mind of God, and it's about religiously inspired terrorism. And why is it that religions which profess peace and love and nonviolence uh, are so often invoked as a reason for doing exactly the opposite? And so he's conducted extensive interviews. And it's really interesting. He's talked with scary people. Uh, he, he's done interviews with terrorists in jail uh, who agreed to talk with him about why they did what they did. In fact, they're, they, they want to talk about it. They're, they're eager to talk about it. So uh, he has gotten a lot of material, a lot of information. So uh, quite a bit has been written on religion and violence. And, and Mike and I were thinking, well, it would be good to have something on religion and nonviolence. <laughs> uh, so right. uh, what's the positive side of this equation? And then, uh, you know, and how are the two related? How, how do traditions that teach nonviolence end up getting invoked as justifications for violence? So uh, Mark uh, very generously wrote the uh, foreword, the introduction uh, to the book. And so his introduction is, is excellent. It really lays out the problem well. And then we have chapters on, my chapter starts it off uh, with uh, Hinduism. We have a really excellent chapter by a scholar named Brian Donaldson, who, who's done the Jainism chapter. Uh, we have uh, Buddhism, uh, the Sikh tradition. These are all what we call Dharma traditions, traditions that arose in India and share quite a few assumptions in common. Then we move on to the Abrahamic traditions, so Judaism, Christianity, Islam. And then uh, we were hoping to get even more. We were hoping to get uh, something on traditional African religion, Native American religion. Uh -huh. you know, there are many, many more faiths out there than just the big isms that, that, that people are familiar with. Uh, Chinese traditions like Taoism, Confucianism. And uh, it was very difficult. And I think this because it was during the pandemic. So uh, we sent out, he and I both, a lot of emails to a lot of scholars and people either declined or they declined, but gave us names of other people who might do it. And then those people declined <laughs> <laughs> or, or, uh, or in some cases we just didn't even get a reply. And uh, I think this was because the pandemic was raging as we were doing this. This was a project we were working on each from our respective home. Uh, you know, I was on my laptop in my living room and uh, not going out much. And so we, we did this, uh, you know, we had to coordinate everything uh, by email, but it was it was difficult during the pandemic, but we did get people for uh, the you know those seven very well known traditions, and we did get a scholar to write on um, uh, Oceania Pacific Island traditions, which was a very nice contribution, and uh, uh, it rounds it out I think a little bit. It's more than just the big sort of traditions of the book, but you've got uh, uh, this uh, indigenous tradition of of. Uh, the Pacific, uh, Southern Pacific, um, in in there as well. Uh, I'm talking about nonviolence. So that, I, I, that I'm I'm quite proud of the book. It's a short little book. Uh, again, we were envisioning many more chapters, and we just weren't able to get uh, the contribution. So it's called "Nonviolence in the World's Religions: A Concise Introduction." So <laughs> we're not we're not claiming for it to be the comprehensive guide, but it's a it's a nice introduction, and I think it's perfect for the kind of course that Mike was teaching. Um, he's no longer at our college, but when he was here, he was teaching this course on religion and nonviolence. I may some at some point take it up uh, and uh, I would use that book uh, as a textbook. And in fact, right now I'm teaching an online course for an organization called Embodied Philosophy, a mm -hmm. uh, four part online course on religion and nonviolence. Just had the second session uh, yesterday. And uh, so I, I find that the book is a good teaching tool. But even if you're not a scholar or a teacher um, or a college student, if you're just interested in the topic, it's a nice broad overview. So I, I recommend the book widely. So there are two strands I want to follow out of all of that. And I feel like you perfect, like you, you set up our... You set up our, our pillar in the present with the book. And now I run to run the film backwards to mix metaphors all the way back to you talked about um, 
kind of a, a formative moment when you saw the movie Gandhi and saw nonviolence as this powerful tool in the world. Um, what did your journey look like from that time as a youngster all the way into college? Because one, one thing that did happen is you kind of left maybe the faith tradition you were born into and converted to Hinduism. So what was that journey like from way back when in your teens, preteens, all the way to young adulthood and why conversion? Sure, sure. I, I can tell you about that. And, and the, the conversion question is an important one. So um, I'll, I'll go back a couple more years before I talk <laughs> okay. about the, right? Uh, when I was 10, uh, so okay, I'll just, I'll back up completely. I, I, I grew up in a small town in Missouri, a place called Montgomery City. So shout out to Montgomery City if anyone there's listening. And um, my family uh, were, you know, were from there. And uh, I grew up Catholic, uh, growing up, going, going to our local Catholic church. And I was, and let me just ask Montgomery city is probably a small, did, did you like growing up in Montgomery city? I didn't mind growing up in Montgomery city. You know, it's interesting. Um, People often say very strong things about their upbringing. Either it was wonderful or it was terrible. (laughs) I just didn't, I didn't know anything else. I guess it was just, it was just life. You know, Um, I, I have to say I used my imagination a lot to, sort of escape from my surroundings. So maybe that's not a, a, a positive thing to say. Uh, but uh, but I had a really nice close circle of friends and I'm still in touch with them. So I'd have to say there were there were some things that were, I mean, of course, teenage years are not good anywhere. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you are. So I, that period was not great, but I have good friends from there that I still stay in touch with. And uh, so I can't say that it was a, an entirely bad experience. So I know what you mean. I feel like uh, people who grow up in, in quote unquote small towns or smaller towns, a lot of times it seems like they have, they are really love it. And if they leave, they want to come back. They're very nostalgic and that's where they want to build their family. And then other people despise it and desperately need to get to the big city. But I, right. I can totally see how you know, there's probably a lot of people who fall in the middle and don't have that strong opinion. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of neither way. I um I did end up living far from there. I'm now in Pennsylvania, but that's just because that's where my career took me. <laughs> right. Uh, for me, it was about what I wanted to do. And uh, if I had found a job teaching at, say, University of Missouri, uh, I'd be there. Uh, right. But this is there are not a lot of jobs in my field, so I went uh, where I could, and I felt very fortunate to, when I applied for jobs. I, I got one right away, and it's the job I still have. I, I have. <laughs> Still here, 23 years later. So, uh, and they hired my wife too. My wife's also a professor. She teaches Japanese, and uh, we came here together uh, from Chicago. We met at University of Chicago, uh-huh. kind of like when Harry met Sally, right? They meet at University of Chicago. So, uh, my wife and I met at University of Chicago, and she, she, you should interview her sometime. She is from India and teaches Japanese in the United States. Wow. So very international. Very, she's, now, she's very cosmopolitan. She, she's not a small town person. Uh, but we joke about it because Elizabethtown actually is a fairly small town. Uh, she in her life has lived in New Delhi, Tokyo, Chicago, and Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. So, <laughs> so Big city, big city, big city, much smaller city. Much smaller city. <laughs> But Elizabethtown is very close to D.C., Philadelphia, uh, not too far from New York. Uh, Pittsburgh and Boston are drivable in a day. So we feel very connected to the East Coast cities here. Uh, And yet we have the benefit of living in a pretty small, relaxed, uh, quiet uh, space. So uh, I think it's the best of both worlds. And uh, we do go back and visit uh, Missouri because my mother's still there. And I have, like I said, have good friends that are still there and a few other family members. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, no, I, my, my being drawn to Hinduism, it was, yeah. was not really, it wasn't like a youthful rebellion against my environment. It was, it really c- came from a thought process. So my, my father, when I was 10, my father was in a really very bad accident and uh, it left him, uh, in a, I mean, I don't want to, sometimes I tell this story in too much detail and it actually upsets people. So I, I'm going to refrain from that. He was left very badly off physically and mentally by his injuries. Okay. And in uh, 1981, so two years later, when I was 12, uh, he passed away. Okay. And uh, that was, uh, th- it was a big drama. It went on for almost two years. And it, because it was a small town, everybody knew everything about our lives and what was going on. And again, that's both good and bad. You know, I was going to ask if it felt supportive or intrusive, and maybe it was both. It was both. It was okay. exactly both. You have people who, you, who really make you feel 
uh, supported and loved. And then you have people that you just wish they'd mind their own business. And, yeah. and, we, and we had both. We had both. That, that's, that's life in a small town. Uh, but as a consequence of that, yeah. I became, I, I think, almost obsessed with the afterlife with questions like, why does God allow suffering in the world? What's the whole purpose of this existence in the physical world in the first place? I mean, I really, I delved deep into the philosophical questions. And I thought about these things a lot. And uh, a little thing about not just myself, but my whole family, we were Catholic, and I would say devoutly Catholic, but at the same time, very independent minded. Um, we didn't, uh, you know, Missouri is the show me state, right? We, we don't just take things on faith. You, you, <laughs> you, need, you need a good argument, right? It has yeah. to make sense. And so, you know, and, and I'm still like that. You know, I, I'm, I'm a believer. I have a, a belief system and a worldview, uh, but I'm always testing it, right? And they say in, in the Hindu tradition, when you meet your spiritual teacher, your guru, they say you should always test your guru, right? Make sure this is a bona fide teacher. And so I, I test everything and question everything. And, it, and when I, really, when I look back on my upbringing, I was probably as influenced by Star Trek and Star Wars as I was by the church. Um, my, my outlook was very shaped by popular culture, and I always loved science fiction. Um, in fact, I'm going to a conference in a few days on the philosophical implications of extraterrestrial life. So, I mean, this is still a topic that's very, <laughs> yeah, it still interests, still interests me. So, you know, and I, I had a lot of questions. I, for example, now this yeah. may change, sound strange to many viewers, but this is one of many questions that I was asking around the age of, you know, from 12 to say 14. Um, so if in order for human beings to be saved, uh, God had to come to earth in human form. God had to come up as Jesus and, and die for our sins and save us. So if there's intelligent life on other planets, did God have to also appear in those forms on those planets and do something similar for those living beings? Uh, and so would that mean there are multiple divine incarnations? And of course, this also got me thinking about life on our own planet. And of course, uh, um, uh, I, I grew up Catholic, but many of the people in my small town were uh, evangelical Protestants. And a lot of them believed that unless you followed not just Christianity, but their form of Christianity, right. you were you would not be saved. I was told I was going to hell because I was Catholic. And then when they found out I was a weird Catholic who was reading <laughs> about world religions, then they knew, you know, I was going to hell. And so, um, but I always thought, well, if God is love, then there must be a way that's made available for people from all traditions, all backgrounds, all paths. Because if, if, I, if I were me, but born in Saudi Arabia, I would probably be as devout, devoutly Muslim as I was devoutly Catholic growing up in Missouri. So why, if I were a Muslim, should I convert to Christianity? It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense for me. So wouldn't God's grace be available in some form that a Muslim could accept, that a Hindu could accept, that a Buddhist could accept, or even a non-religious person? I was also a big fan of Carl Sagan growing up, and uh, he's the first famous person whose autograph I ever got. I got to meet him when I was 14, and he was wow. a skeptic about religion, but he talked about science in a way that I would say is very spiritual. He talked about the beauty of the universe and the process of, of learning about the universe. So I've, I long have kind of been drawn to this view that there's, tr there's truth in many paths in many ways. So after I saw the movie Gandhi, I got excited. Yeah. I started reading everything I could on Gandhi. And there was a quote of his that just really blew my mind. He said, uh, the world's great religions are many paths to the same goal. What does it matter which path we take so long as the goal is the same? And to me, that just made sense. It, it, it fit with the idea of a loving God, right? That would be available to everyone in a form they could understand and approach. Yeah. So I really liked that idea. And as I was learning about Gandhi, I was also a, a big Beatles fan, which I still am. And, you know, George Harrison was really into India and Hinduism. And I was listening to his music and he's got, you know, in his album cover art, you know, for some of your listeners, we'll have to explain that there used to be these things called albums. <laughs> that you could play right, and right. You could put on a turntable. So he had these album cover, and he would quote from the Bhagavad Gita and talk about Krishna. And uh, the, the things I was reading about Gandhi, Gandhi would mention the Bhagavad Gita. So I thought, well, this Bhagavad Gita sounds like an important book. I should try to find it. 
and it wasn't something that was readily available in my hometown. Um, they, you know, they had a couple of books on Gandhi in the library, but there was nothing on, uh, no Bhagavad Gita. And the, this was the really kind of funny turning point in my life. So my, uh, my grandmother used to go to all of these yard sales and flea markets and sell arts and crafts that she made and also yeah. buy things, you know, old stuff, other people's old stuff. And I would go with her to help her, but also that's where I would get like old comic books and, and sci-fi paperbacks and things that people were selling. So I went, uh, to this sale that was in the uh it was in the parking lot of the methodist church in montgomery city and i saw this table it had a bunch of books and magazines i thought okay that's where that's what i'm interested in and right on top of the pile there was the bhagavad gita (laughs) like last thing i expected to see there this is the book and this i i i joke that this is when i became a born again hindu because uh uh, it, it didn't really happen that way but it was a very very dramatic moment i opened the book and uh, some of your listeners might know about ISKCON, that is the Hare Krishna's uh, International Society for Krishna Consciousness. That was a Hindu organization that came into the U.S. in the 60s. And George Harrison was interested in them for a period of time. And uh, they, they used to, you know, chant their mantra out, uh, you know, on the streets of New York. And, you know, people thought they were very strange. Um, but uh, this, this was a translation that uh, their founder had written. And it's very, very vividly illustrated. And I opened the book randomly. And the first thing I saw was a picture. And it was of a man who had just died. He was surrounded by his family who were crying and lamenting and in mourning. And then standing at a distance, there was a Hindu monk who was watching them with compassion. And he could see the the divinity in the heart of of all of these people. And uh, at the bottom of the picture, it said, the wise lament neither the living nor the dead. And this really uh, made an impression on me. I just, I, I, uh, those words spoke to me. So I gave a page number and I looked it up and it's the passage in the Bhagavad Gita where the Hindu deity Krishna is instructing his friend Arjuna, who's a warrior. He's about to go into battle Mm -hmm. and he's very nervous about going into battle. Is this the right thing to do? And so Krishna gives him this discourse on, you know, on spirituality basically. And, um one of the first things he says is uh, we are not this body we are the infinite self that has always existed uh just as uh someone casts off old and worn out clothing and puts on a new set so the soul casts off the body and takes on a new one and there's essentially there is no death right there is there's nothing to fear from death and this was this was very powerful for me in the wake of my father's passing away because one of the things I was thinking about obsessively was the afterlife. And yeah. I had kind of come up with my own model of reincarnation in that process. I had not yet studied Hinduism, but now I was looking at it and it's like, this is exactly the way I'm thinking. And it's in this strange book from another culture that it was here in the Methodist church parking lot. Um, I sometimes tell people it's, it felt like being like being an extraterrestrial raised by human parents and then finding an artifact from your home planet. <laughs> Right? It's, it was like that scene in the old Superman movie, right in the seventies, that that uh, where he finds that green crystal from Krypton, you know, yeah. and it takes that. That was my green crystal from Krypton, the Bhagavad Gita, and I still have that copy. Uh, I I kept it, and so that was the beginning of what ended up being many years of reading, studying, thinking, meeting mm-hmm. people, and uh, I didn't study all this with an eye on conversion. Right, I I was Catholic. I grew up Catholic. In my own mind, I had a way of reconciling all of these ideas that made sense to me. And I figured I could still be a good Catholic and believe this way. And I studied theology at University of Notre Dame and with some really good teachers. One of my teachers, in fact, had been a student of uh, the man who became Pope Benedict, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger was uh, the teacher of one of my teachers. So I was I was getting Catholicism right, right from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And I realized that my belief system was different enough from what the church was teaching that my intention had to been to go on and be a priest and, and be a theologian. And because I'm, I'm just interested in these things, right? This yeah. is what I love thinking about and studying. And I just, I realized that if I did that, I would be in constant conflict with the church. And I didn't want that. I, did, I didn't, I, I wanted to, if I was going to join something, I wanted to be something I could join honestly and fully and without any reservations. Did you have a conflict with any of the Catholic 
kind of leaders who had been around you, especially at that time where you're sort of sorting this out, or was this kind of an internal journey and was not you wrestling with any of these authority figures in any way? It was much more internal. I would ask questions. I, 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 ta- I would talk incessantly about these things with anyone, okay, who, yeah. with anyone who would listen. I know, and I was a weird kid, right? People thought I was strange, but uh, I would talk with, uh, with priests and so on about this. And um, what I found was there was a point at which when I would question, they would say, well, you just have to go by faith. And, and I interpreted that to mean they didn't know the answer to the question. <laughs> but I just, I, I thought, okay, the, the logic of it is broken. And in right. fact, I'll tell you something. Uh, and, and again, this is, by the way, I'm, I'm not anti-Catholic. I, I still have a very uh, high regard for the Catholic church. And I'm grateful that I grew up in that tradition yeah. and the moral values it instilled in me. It was really my starting point in, in this lifetime. And I'm, I'm grateful so I, I, I want to preface what I'm about to say, uh, but um, a fairly well-known Catholic theologian who I will not name uh, told me a couple of years ago uh, after a conference, he said, you ask questions for which I think the church does not have answers. And he's, and he's, a, he's a devout Catholic. Right? I mean, right. he, he, he does not agree with my interpretation, but uh there are things which I think in, in many faiths that you just kind of take on faith, right? That you just uh, believe and accept. And for me, there were, there were incompatibilities I saw between um, what I saw as the, the basic logic of, of the tradition mm-hmm. and, and some of the teachings. Like, for example, like the idea of hell. Um, there are hells in traditions like Hinduism and Buddhism. So these places that, you know, people who've done horrible things uh will suffer i mean if if your worldview says that it doesn't matter whether you were hitler or whether you were gandhi there's a problem right so uh i do believe in uh people having to learn their lessons but if you think about eternal damnation i don't see the point of that because any kind of punishment whenever i was naughty and my parents uh punished me and they always explain said this is to teach you to be better so you don't do that again yeah but eternal damnation has no end. So, I mean, even if you improve and repent, it's too late. You're, you're damned. And I think that's, I think that's a big problem. And then another big problem is, of course, if God is all knowing and created you knowing you were going to be damned eternally, then God has created you in effect to suffer for all eternity. And that, I just don't think that's the God of love that Jesus taught or that any of the, the great teachers have talked about. So the idea of reincarnation made a lot of sense to me because it's like you still have to do your time, so to speak. You still have to <laughs> do, you know, learn your lessons, but you have as many second chances as you need to improve and get better and, and eventually make your way out of all of this and, and achieve salvation or liberation, as it's called in Hinduism. So like these ideas just make a lot of sense to me. So I, I, I'm inclined to believe them. I do believe them. And what I found is it where I did actually have conflict was then in college, because then I was getting really serious about, okay, now I have to make a choice. Am I, right. am I going to go into the seminary? What am I going to do? And uh, person after person told me that, you know, what you believe is not compatible with church teaching. And I think their intent was that I would then change what I believe. That's but, yes. I was wondering when I asked about, I wondered if people tried to talk you back in. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> definitely. And if I'd heard an argument that was persuasive, it, I, I would have stayed. Would have been but, talked but, back in, yeah. Yeah, but I would have been talked back in. And then there, uh, other things happened in college too. Um, there are, you know, religion is not just about belief. So there's also a sense of belonging and a sense of community. Yeah. And I felt that sense of belonging and community in my small town parish growing up. Um, at Notre, Notre Dame is a wonderful university and I have very, very good friends from there. So again, I don't want anyone to take me as being negative, but I did not feel that same sense of community. Uh, I, I had a group of friends I felt that with, and that was a group of friends who were multi-religious. They were international. They were from mm-hmm. all different countries and so on. But uh, I, I felt a disconnect with uh, a lot of the folks uh, that were there. And then something else happened. There was a, an English professor that someone told me about. And I sat in on his class. I never actually took a class with him, but he allowed me to attend, to audit the class. And 
he was looking at the transcendentalists. That is uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry I David. I love, yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and he was drawing connections between their writings and Hindu writings, which were influencing them. So uh, we talked about Emerson in conjunction with the Upanishads, Thoreau in conjunction with the Bhagavad Gita, oh. and Walt Whitman with devotional Hindu poetry called Bhakti poetry. And uh, I loved that class. And the professor, it turned out, was... Uh, a follower of a Hindu spiritual teacher. I, I don't think he defined himself as Hindu per se, but he had a, a Hindu spiritual teacher. And there were a couple of other students in the class who were also devotees, members of this particular kind of yoga movement uh, that yeah. was there. It's called Siddha Yoga. And so th- he had gatherings at his house every Tuesday evening. And we would meet, we would watch a video of, 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 of the guru giving a talk. And then there would be some chanting and some meditation. And then we'd have snacks and chat, you know, afterward. So those two students and I attended that. And then local people there in South Bend, Indiana, who were devotees of that of that teacher uh, would attend. And so there would be about a dozen people there every Tuesday night. And that became my church. I felt right at home with that group of people and, uh, you know, with, with with the church, I was finding that because my beliefs had moved in a more Hindu direction, whenever we would recite the Apostles' Creed, for example, I was kind of adjusting it in my mind to make it fit with what I, <laughs> what I believed. And so resurrection, so that's kind of like rebirth. So, you know, like I was, you know, making, making that work that way, uh, you know. Um, so when I went for, for these gatherings, uh, that they call it a satsang, that's a spiritual gathering in, in mm-hmm. Hinduism, uh, I didn't have to adjust anything. It all made perfect sense to me, and I felt right at home. And I really felt like I had come come home in a sense. And so I continued with that. And professionally, too, interesting things happened because I met a professor at Notre Dame um, whose class I was taking. Uh, he, he was teaching the kinds of things I teach here now. Uh-huh. Um, Paul J. Griffiths, who incidentally is a very devout Catholic, and in fact, he converted from the Anglican faith. He's from the UK. He converted from the Anglican faith to Catholicism around the same time I formally joined the Hindu tradition. So uh, I joked with him about, you know, it's like the revolving door of the church. He didn't one in, it, one out. <laughs> yeah, one in, one out. He, did, he didn't think it was funny, but uh, oh, he didn't. Okay. I thought it was funny. But, uh, you know, he, uh, but I loved what he was teaching. And he was basically just, you know, the history and philosophy of, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so on. So on the second day of class, I followed him back to his office and basically said, you know, teach me, oh, great master. You know, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I knew I wanted to be a teacher. You know, I had this idea of being a theologian and going the priest route. Yeah. That was looking not likely at this point. So about my third year in college, but teaching about these things in a university setting. I said, oh, that would be wonderful. I would really enjoy that. So he became my advisor and he recommended that I go to graduate school at University of Chicago, which really is for my field, I would say it's probably the top place, right? With all respect to the other universities. Sure. Uh, university of Chicago is great with languages. I mean, with lots of other things. So uh, they have a wonderful anthropology program. So I applied to University of Chicago and then as good fortune would have it, he was hired there at the same time. So oh, I followed him from Notre Dame to Chicago. And it's funny, we had two Bible scholars at Notre Dame, John and Adela Collins, uh, who also migrated from Notre Dame to Chicago. So Notre Dame lost three really excellent theology professors to the University of Chicago Divinity School. And then I went there also. I don't think I was missed as much at the time, but uh, uh, that's where I went for my master's and then my PhD. And I met my wife there. And uh, went to India and she and I were married in India. We had a traditional Hindu wedding Uh and I had the option there to actually formally join the Hindu tradition. Now the Hindu tradition is very informal. Most Hindus will tell you there's no such thing as conversion to Hinduism. If you want to follow it, follow it, but that's your business, right? It's not a proselytizing tradition generally. So there's no attempt to say you should become Hindu because there's a belief that all religions lead to the same ultimate goal if if hinduism works for you good but you know no pressure but for me this was the culmination of of the trajectory i had been on all of this time it was a kind of public affirmation of what was already the case you know i was meditating i was uh you know 
following, uh, I, I was studying the, these traditions and these yeah. texts and it, it was part of my life. So I said, let me just become Hindu, right? So I did. Um, I would say that that did not, that formal change didn't, wasn't a big spiritual transformation, right? Not, not like finding the Gita in the parking lot. For me, the bigger spiritual transformation happened a few years later, actually, after my wife and I would, had been teaching, both teaching here at Elizabethtown for a while, we met a Swami, a Hindu monk from, uh, the, the Hinduism has sub-traditions, right? Just like Christianity, right? So Catholicism, Methodism, Lutheranism, and so on. So this is a tradition in, in India, it's called the Ramakrishna Mission, in America, it's called the Vedanta Society. It's the oldest Hindu organization in America. Uh, Swami Vivekananda brought this tradition to the U.S. in the 1890s. And so we met um, a monk. He is the head of the Ramakrishna Vedanta Society in Boston. And he also is a Hindu student's chaplain at both Harvard and MIT. And we became his students right he we yeah. he formally became our guru that was in 2005 that was a very powerful experience because you know till then i was i guess what you could call it maybe a generic hindu right there there, there was no specific, <laughs> specific hindu tradition that i felt that i was sure. part of i was just you know drawn to all of it and and so on but uh, really the vedanta tradition the ramakrishna tradition is that that is it, it fits perfectly with my own thinking and understanding and now we have a teacher we have a meditation practice and we've been very uh you know strict with that ever since then uh 2005 so that's my that's my life journey in a nutshell right in about half an hour uh both and and in terms of conversion like for me i see truth in all religions i see jesus as a great spiritual master so for me it's not it's not like i change sides or like, I don't like even the word convert is not, I'm not crazy about, I sort of feel like I grew or evolved into this. Um, and it's, it's still the same me and it's still the same basic values and, and worldview, but I now am part of a community that affirms all of that and uh, that uh, supports me in all of that. And that I also do my best to support and help in any way that I can, because the, there are a lot of misconceptions about Hinduism uh, in the Western world. There's a lot of uh, a term uh, more people are using now is Hindu phobia, right? Kind of like Islamophobia. Yeah. Uh, you don't hear the term as much, but uh, you know, w there are people who will instinctively associate Hinduism with uh Oh, uh, you know, oh, in, India is poor and dirty. And, you know, they'll say, well, that's because the British removed $45 trillion from it over the course of their, their uh, rule, right? So they're like, there's history there that people don't know. Uh, you know, people think a lot of strange things about Hinduism in schools. Uh, the emphasis is mainly on the traditional Indian social system, which has come to be called caste. But there was caste all over the world at one time. Europeans also had caste. That's why we have last names like Baker and Smith and Miller. Like that's if you go back far enough, that's what people's ancestral jobs were. Uh, so uh, th there are a lot of preoccupations with those kinds of things, and I think it misses a lot of the really profound philosophy that attracted me to it. And uh, yeah, and you don't have to be Hindu or call yourself Hindu to uh, find that inspiring or interesting or, or draw from it. Maybe we could go. So I feel like that entire story is perfect because I, you know, you, the, you, the finding the Bhagavad Gita was formative for you. These feelings you had about nonviolence, these feelings, all these religions coming together. Another path that many sort of new, I, I will call them new atheists, let's say in the last 20 years. Yes. And not just that, way before them, many people rejecting, secularizing and saying the problem with violence in the world is not just human, it's exacerbated by religion and not the religion you're talking about where people sort of shift in and out. And it's, a, it's kind of a, you know, you're on your own personal journey, but tribally gathering together our followers because we think everyone in the world should be, we should believe what we believe. So some people, instead of finding nonviolence in religion, reject religion in seeking nonviolence. So I think that brings us right to this book and your ideas. Where do you fall in that, given how much violence is perpetrated by religious and the non-religious? How does, what is, what is your thinking on that? Right, right. So, uh, so when Swami Vivekananda came to America in 1853, yeah. he spoke at the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago. And near the end of his speech, he said, 
Uh, sectarianism, bigotry, and fanaticism have long possessed this beautiful earth. And he goes on and talks about how these three tendencies have destroyed civilizations and caused bloodshed. He doesn't say religion, but he says sectarianism. So that's, I think, another, I think we could say tribalism is kind of a synonym for that. Sure, yeah. Our group, right? Bigotry, other groups can't be as good as us. And fanaticism, right? Believing all of this with great intensity, you know, so that, that you know, it becomes irrational. Yeah. I see that those three attitudes as occurring within religion, but I see them occurring within secular philosophies and movements as well. Um, most of the bloodshed in the 20th century was between secular political philosophies, communism, Nazism, fascism. Uh, these were incredibly violent. And uh, um, now, of course, people define religion in different ways. I, I, I'm a Bill Maher fan, but I, don't, I disagree with him on this one topic. Uh, Bill Maher uh, said, well, when you talk about communism, well, that's really a religion, right? So what he's doing is just using the relig- word religion to refer right. to <laughs> sectarianism, bigotry, and fanaticism. I think that's a little unfair. And then, and then what I've heard, not just him, I, I don't want to pick on him, but other people do. The good stuff in religion, they'll say, well, that's spirituality. So the word religion has become the container for all the bad things about religion and all the good things about religion. Well, we're going to call those spirituality. That way we can just cast all of our anger onto religion. And with all respect to the new atheists, there are a lot of smart people in that camp. But what it does is it just it makes it very easy then to say, oh, the problem's religion. Get rid of that and everything will be fine. But our human tendency toward tribalism, bigotry, and fanaticism uh, is not thereby uprooted, right? And I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think it's actually a spiritual problem. It is a social and a psychological and a political problem, but it's also a problem within us, right, that we feel that in order to be complete, we need to be part of the group that's right, that's best, that's on top, and that everyone else is, has to therefore be bad and wrong, Um I have a good friend who's a Buddhist, and uh, we were at an interfaith gathering once, and he, he put this really beautifully. He likened one's relationship to one's religion to one's relationship with one's spouse or partner. And he said uh, about himself, he said, I love my wife. He said, I think my wife is the most wonderful woman in the world, and there's no one like her. He said, I do not therefore think that everyone else's wife is terrible and bad and you know, just, just an awful person. Uh, no, you know, they're good for the people they're with, and, and the husbands are good for the, the wives that they're with, and, and, and all the other partners and, and, and so on. And uh, so uh, I think it's one of our tragedies that to be for something we have we think we also therefore have to be against something and so okay i'm hindu therefore i can't like islam or christianity and that's really not the authentic spirit of of the indian traditions if you look people have been reading each other's books and going to each other's places of worship for centuries in india and that's that's been the norm same in japan uh people practice a blend of buddhism and shinto even a little bit of christianity is in there and I think we're picking up something of that in America with this spiritual but not religious movement. People are using the word religious, I think, in a problematic way. They mean kind of fanatical adherence to one thing, but they still want to draw from many traditions and uh, get the wisdom that's there. And uh, I, I think that's a much more optimistic, uh, more hopeful way of, of mode of being than this kind of tribalism, us and them. I have had people ask me, say, why call yourself Hindu? Because then you then you're aligned with the group. Why not just say you're spiritual? You know, because sure. when people kind of uncover what I really believe, they see that. I think here the the thing for me is that being part of a not part of a tribe, but part of what in the Hindu tradition we would call a, a lineage mm-hmm. is is important, right? The fact that I have a teacher and uh, he was the student of a teacher, and then his teacher was a student of a woman we call the Holy Mother, uh, Sharada Devi. She was the wife of Ramakrishna, and she, of course, was, was Ramakrishna's student, and we believe he was an, an enlightened being. I, I think that's important. I, I felt, I use the term unplugged, uh, before I connected with my teacher in 2005. Like I said, kind of a generic Hindu or a free-range Hindu. I, I, I do think being grounded in a tradition is important because it helps structure your practice and structure your life. 
But the minute we try to say, now everyone else has to follow the same structure as I do in their life, then we've left the path of wisdom, right? Then, then the fanaticism and the tribalism starts. Right? But on, on the, so to, to, play, to play the other side of that, I completely agree with you that the problems kind of start when you decide that I've got the answer and you don't. But right. obviously with all the well-intentioned, we could, for instance, look at the Christian crusades of, <clears throat> and say, look, many of those people were very well-intentioned. They believed that they had the answer and they needed to share this answer. They were doing the right thing. And I think that maybe infuses the violence in these religious communities. I, I, I don't know. What do you think? I agree with you about that. And I think that's why it's very important that even if we are religious, in fact, especially if we're religious, that we don't give up our capacity for critical thinking. Yeah. Right? That, uh, okay, I want to do the right thing. And uh, there's this, of course, this kind of famous movement now, people say, what would Jesus do? And to really ask that, like, what would Jesus do? What would Buddha do? What would Ramakrishna do? Would they go out, you know, cutting off people's heads and so on? No, I don't think so, right? Yeah. Uh, so to really kind of hold oneself up to that highest bar of behavior uh there's a in 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 uh in the hindu buddhist and jain traditions they they all have lists of moral rules that we should follow right i guess you could compare it to the, the ten commandments and i think it's significant that the first one in every one of these traditions is nonviolence, not harming other living beings uh the term is ahinsa it means uh non-violence in thought word and action and that comes even before uh, the second one is usually satya. That means telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So for me, that ordering is significant. It means, okay, I may have my idea of the truth, but if in the course of following that, I find I'm violating the first principle of nonviolence, maybe I've erred. Maybe I've misinterpreted the truth. Maybe uh, I am going astray. Maybe I'm being fanatical. So I, I, I really believe in nonviolence as a kind of check on all of our interpretations. And Gandhi actually said this. He said, whenever you're contemplating an action, think of how it will affect the poorest, weakest, most helpless person on earth. And if it will benefit them, then good. If not, then do something else, right? So I, I really think that, the, and religions have these, there are these sort of self-critical mechanisms, but yes, they fail. And I do have to agree with the new atheists about that. I mean, they fail alarm with alarming frequency. And uh, I find that very often the leadership of religious communities begins to stray from the deeper principles they are about, and they start to see defending the institution as being most important. And the institution then just becomes hollowed out completely. It's just another power structure. And so in that sense, I, I, I agree with the spirit of what the new atheists are saying when they say there's, there's a lot of corrupt religion that is about power and status and has nothing to do with spiritual life. And that's a problem that the traditions themselves have mechanisms to correct, but those mechanisms fail if people aren't educated in them and don't know them and then have bad leaders who aren't interested in, uh, in that. So it's interesting. It sounds like in, in your, in your study of Hinduism, that nonviolence is maybe much more primary than I see in reading the new Testament and then the, the Jewish Bible, I mean, our God, in Judaism, our God is a jealous God. And the first commandment is not thou shalt not murder. There are other ones that go ahead of that. And it's usually right. we, this is, this is, I'm your God. And that's the most important thing that will guide you. If you remember, I'm your God, that will guide you. Mm -hmm. It sounds like nonviolence maybe is perched more in a, in a more primary place in Hinduism. Um, is that, is that when you looked at the book and the, in the unfolding people explaining nonviolence from the Abrahamic religions Eastern religions, Oceania, did it, did, did you see a difference? Like some, it felt like nonviolence was everything and other ones, ah, oh, it's a piece of the menu here. Right. No, I, I do see it that way uh, to a very great extent that, you know, writing about Hinduism and nonviolence, Jainism and nonviolence, Buddhism and nonviolence is very easy. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, so, uh, and, and uh, I was reading, uh, there was a rabbi uh, whose work I was reading recently who, who is advocating nonviolence and saying, you know, it's an uphill battle because, right. you know, if you open the Torah and that, you know, there are battles and there are God is, you know, smiting someone. Uh, uh, but 
even in those traditions where that's the case, you still find this thread, this core of the affirmation of life. Life is sacred. Life is God's gift. And th- there you have seeds of nonviolence. I have a very secular kind of um, not not too well thought out, but a kind of a secular belief about why this is the case. Yeah. And I think if you look at Judaism and then the traditions that sprang from it, Christianity and Islam, these traditions grew up in a part of the world where they were the people who believed in them were constantly embattled. Uh, Israel was conquered by the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, the conflicts still go on. In fact, I grew up uh, in, in, like I said, a small town in Missouri. And whenever the news was on and some conflict in the Middle East was being mentioned, my grandmother would always say, they've been fighting there for thousands of years. And I mean, you know, and uh, and, and I and it's a harsh environment. There's a lot of yeah, desert, yeah. and you know, oases are seen as really precious things. Like in the Quran, uh, the image for heaven is not clouds and streets of gold; it's flowing water, and that makes sense if you're from the desert. I mean, yeah. you, flowing water is a lot more important than gold, right? In, in that environment, if you look where Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism came, came from, lush environment, rivers, jungles, agriculture going back thousands of years. And uh, just a big, abundant country. Now, India's climate has become more arid uh, in recent centuries. Uh, A lot of that's been due to human activity. Some of it's been due to natural activity. Uh, But certainly in ancient times, it was full of jungles. And you look at all the different kinds of animals that come from India, you know, uh, parrots and cobras and and, (laughs) deer of various kinds and water buffaloes. And what I'm I'm trying to convey is a picture of luxuriant abundance where people can live life and not have quite as much of a struggle for existence. Not that there was no warfare in ancient India, but it it was very regulated. I mean, members of the warrior caste would fight other members of the warrior caste, but the common people would typically not be, you know, there wasn't total warfare like we have now where you attack a whole city and, you know, attack civilians and sort of thing. Uh, So, uh, I just I, I have this picture in my mind of, of India in ancient times as this very uh, kind of genteel place where people could think about the meaning of life. And and so the, and, and this feeling that this sense of gentleness, like even if you look at some of the scriptures where there is violence. Right. So, I mean, we are uh, talking about the Bhagavad Gita, which is literally right before a battle, right before a battle. Right. So there is. And, and again, I, and I'm not trying to romanticize India, uh, but just trying to say that. If you come from a situation of relative luxury, yeah. it's easier to then, I think, think in terms of nonviolence. If you come from a situation of relative deprivation, which I think the Abrahamic traditions did, then it's, you know, you you need a harsh God, right? You know, you're struggling to survive. Yeah. Um, one book that really helped me understand this, science fiction book, uh, but uh, the Dune books of uh, Frank Herbert, right? Uh, the, his Fremen are really modeled on Middle East Eastern peoples and they are harsh because they yes. live in the desert. And if you, if you're soft, you're not going to survive. And uh, I think uh, India is much more traditionally, it was much more of an environment where people could, you know, uh, thrive in a way that maybe was more difficult in, in Middle Eastern societies. Now, again, I, I don't want to over romanticize India. It has its in- inequities and certainly there've been people in every society who got the short end of the stick and that's been true in India uh, as well. And there has been battle and there has been conflict. But the overall ethos of the civilization, I think, is much, very much in a, a direction of, of peace. And uh, there's one scholar I was once reading who's actually known as, as a critic of Hinduism. Uh-huh. But uh, she made a reference to what she called the fundamental sanity of Indian civilization, right? That there was a, that at the end of the day, you wanted to have a peaceful life. And that was more important than conquering your enemies or you know, vanquishing people. It was about living your life and uh, without interference from others. So that feels, so that vision feels very optimistic. And one one of my favorite things is always the fact that especially Jewish prayer is obsessed with peace and the idea of a time with no war, an idea when all the things that are broken are are healed and, you know, beating the swords into plowshares, some utopian ideal. But that also reminds me, I think there's a sense in the religion, and I don't know if it feels like this sometimes, especially in maybe it feels to those in modern India, as we look at India, which has a a really difficult modern times in conflict with especially some nearby neighbors. Yes. um, 
there's, I see these two strands where you, you can kind of, if you don't believe in the utopian ideal that we could get to peace, well, there's one strand, which is sort of nihilistic or uh, sort of universally destructive. And it reminds me, you know, the, you have a tapestry on your wall, kind of the, the, these three different facets of the being that brings the world into being. And then at the end destroys it. I think there's some people, some of these Christians I talk to sometimes feel like this. They just believe, well, at some point, everything's going to wind down and collapse. The Messiah is going to come back. It will get terrible. The whole world will wind down into horrors and then it will be reborn. And they take this as a literal thing. And then I think other people opt out. I think those people are beautiful. I love the Quakers. The fact that Quakers take pacifism so intensely that they opt out and will suffer for it. So you can opt out of violence and war. You can just figure, well, violence and war, I don't participate in it, but there's nothing we can do. And it's going to bring the world to an end. Hmm. How does your thinking fall in and and seeing people kind of pool into those collective collective ideas? Well, my heart is much more in the Quaker direction, uh, <laughs> personally. Yeah, uh, yeah. But as I've researched this topic, and, and this is what I found in, in when I was writing my chapter for this book on yeah. Hinduism, because I talk about the nonviolent philosophy, and I also talk about the, the martial philosophy, the, 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 the military side of it, right? The warrior community. Yes. I mean, there are sects of Hinduism that are warrior sects. They are dedicated to warfare, right? That is part of their spiritual path. Uh, the Sikh tradition, to some extent, participates in, in that ethos. But the idea behind that is not the kind of nihilism uh, that, that you describe very well, that, that I see in a lot of places in the world. Uh, the idea in ancient times, at least in India, was that not everyone is enlightened. Not everyone is focused on spiritual life and on cooperating and living with others. There are people who are crass and greedy and materialistic, and they want right. to take other people's stuff and prey on others. And so you need a subset of society to be trained in the art of war so they can keep those other people in check. So I refer to it as managed conflict so that you, you take that human tendency toward conflict and destruction and and minimize it as much as possible, contain it as much as possible. And here's where the, the social system in India, which uh, again, I mean, there are a lot of things one can and should criticize about the practice of caste, you know, there are inequities, Uh, There are abuses. At the same time, in ancient times, it was a kind of job security and you were trained for a particular task. And if you were not a member of the warrior community, it was not your job to go and fight. And so it was not expected that, you know, it's like, you know, when America goes to war, it's like, okay, everyone needs to support the war effort. uh, You know, but uh, in India, traditionally, it's like, hey, the warriors are going to go do their thing. And the potters are going to keep making pots. The farmers are going to keep farming and the priests are going to keep performing rituals and they're going to be undisturbed. And there's a beautiful story. There was a Greek traveler named Megasthenes and he was uh, an, an ambassador to the court of uh, Chandragupta Maurya back in the uh, fourth century BC. And according to his account, he, he wrote a beautiful account of India, the Indica. And it was the main source of knowledge about India and Europe for, for many centuries. He said, as he was, At one point when he was traveling to one side of the road, he saw two armies clashing in a field. They were having a big fight, right? It was one of those Bhagavad Gita type, you know, wars happening. Chariots and arrows and horses and elephants and people fighting. And then on the other side of the road in the adjacent field was a farmer plowing with his ox. Apparently unconcerned and uninterested in the battle raging nearby because (laughs) He knew that he would not be uh, the victim of that violence, right? That it would, it would be a great uh, source of dishonor for a warrior to harm someone who was incapable of fighting back, right? So, uh, and, and this, is, this is there in the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Dharma Shastras, all these texts talk about this. And maybe it wasn't observed perfectly all the time. I, I doubt it was, but it was observed quite a bit. Uh, and Megasthenes was certainly struck by it because, you know, in Greece, you know, he said, you know, that farmer would have been pressed into service to fight in the war by one or the other of the sides. Oh, no, he's a farmer. He's doing his farming. Uh, The warriors are doing their warrioring and life goes on. And I think this is tied to the concept of rebirth because you have the idea in Hinduism that the utopian society will not happen in this cycle of rebirth, that the true perfection we seek is beyond time, beyond space, beyond this world, So you make this world as good as you can, but then you're ultimately trying to get out of it, right? And for a long time, I was disturbed by this idea 
because I grew up in the West and with the idea of progress. And, you know, I'm a Star Trek fan. I'd like to see a utopian society. Exactly, right. Like to see wherever. your Federation. Yeah. Yeah. They have the Federation, everyone, everyone <laughs> getting along. No, so even in Star Trek, you know, they're fighting the Klingons and the Borg and, you know, right. and so on. It's, it's, it's hard for us to visualize a world without conflict. But as I've gotten older and the more I've studied history and historical movements, I've found that utopian people are scary uh that uh, some of the most totalitarian uh rigid movements started with very beautiful visions of of uh harmonious and equal society i guess i'm thinking about marxism here in particular yeah. which you know there i i had a phase of life where i was very taken with with marx and uh yeah every time i read the communist manifesto i'm i mean some of the things in it i wouldn't want put in place but it sounds beautiful yeah, it's yeah. Beautiful. And when the Dalai Lama read it, he said, well, th- he's aiming for the same society that the Buddha is teaching about. Yeah. And then he met Mao and Mao said, well, religion is poison and must be eradicated. And then Tibet was invaded and, you know, systematically yeah. stripped of its of its resources and people were driven out. So, you know, if the scary thing about a utopian belief is that that utopia is so good it's so important to achieve that it justifies doing anything in the present moment to bring it about. And that can include murder, terrorism, uh, political assassination, deception. I mean, that basically the history of the Communist Party in yeah. uh, Russia and China, you know, uh, or North Korea, for that matter. You know, I don't think North Korea is much of a utopia. Uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to be there. Uh, so... Um, I, I think this idea of managed conflict that, that you see it in, you find it in Indian texts going all the way back to, there's a text called the Arta Shastra. It's, it was written by a philosopher who supposedly was the advisor of King Chandragupta, right? Who uh-huh. started the first big empire in India. I find it's a, it's a very sane kind of realistic worldview. It's like, okay, we can't eliminate conflict, but how can we minimize it? And I could see an institution maybe like the United Nations playing a really important role in the world someday. I don't think it's quite able to do that yet because it's dependent on the good graces of its member states. But, you know, some way that we could set up a not a global government, but uh, a very decentralized uh, system of checks and balances where we keep conflict to a minimum, because. Uh, what we're doing hasn't, I mean, obviously isn't working. Right? But if you look at the Ukraine situation, um, you know, any, any one power can, you know, step out of line and really start to wreak havoc on the world order. So it's not stable. Um, but what the Artha Shastra envisions is kind of a stable order among nations where there is still competition and there's still uh, sort of jockeying for advantage because that's human nature. Yeah. Uh, but it's contained. It's, it's uh, offset by duties and obligations and responsibilities that keep that from becoming you know, from growing out of out of proportion. So I guess that would be my utopian ideal would be the sort of non utopian <laughs> conflict management situation. I think my my final question. So given all of that thinking, your thinking and the, and the things you've dug into about nonviolence, what ultimately is your hope if you teach about nonviolence in your classes? and you and your colleagues do, and do you, you write books like this, what ultimately do you kind of hope people take away from understanding how nonviolence plays out in their and other people's religions? What, do you, what are you hoping for? Okay, so several things, uh, se- several levels, I would say, of, of things that I hope for through uh, the book and also through yeah. a teaching about this thing. One of my bedrock convictions, one of the reasons I went into this field is I, I truly believe that if people understood the world's religions better. If we all knew more about each other's traditions, it would be much easier to cultivate empathy, to see the others as not so other from oneself. And that militates against the tribalism and the bigotry. It's like, no, they're just like us, right? I mean, they're different, but same basic human desires being channeled in in somewhat different ways and, and articulated in different ways and some genuine insights, right? In each tradition, each tradition kind of brings its own gift to the world, I think. Uh, there are things that Buddhism is very good at that no other tradition can quite do. There are things that Islam is very good at that no other tradition can quite do. Yeah. Things that Christianity, are, you know, that are its specialization. So if we can uh, have that kind of appreciative view of traditions, broadly speaking, I think that's going to help cultivate empathy and, and, and militate against the, the more negative impulses that lead us toward uh, violence. Secondly, 
uh, certainly in in the traditions of India, uh, ahimsa, nonviolence, is part of a spiritual path. Yeah. So if people can incorporate nonviolence into their individual lives, regardless of what may be happening on the level of the nation state or the world, you sure. know, we may be at war. You might say, okay, we want to support one side because it's clearly you know in the right. But in your personal life, to cultivate nonviolence, I think that's extremely important. I think it. It uh, it makes our lives better uh, in so many ways. And then uh, finally, I guess the last thing I would say about that is I would like to think that someone along the line, somewhere along the line, someone will read this book or someone will hear a podcast like this who's actually in a position to make a difference, right? Uh, someone in, in the position of power to say, okay, this is persuasive. I think we need to work toward better systems of conflict resolution and, yeah. and start to institute those. And, and so I would like to have that persuasive uh, impact uh, as well, if possible. So yeah, those are my hopes for this kind of teaching. Uh, there's, a, there's a teaching in the Bhagavad Gita, they call it, in, in English, it translates as detachment from the fruits of action. And it, 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 it teaches us humility. It says, we don't really do anything. God does everything. We are God's instruments. So do your duty, right? Do your dharma, do the best you can, and then let it go. And I'm a big believer in that too, because uh, back when I was in college, the first Persian Gulf War happened, you know, when Iraq invaded Kuwait. And I was uh, among the peace activists at the time saying, oh, we shouldn't go to war. We shouldn't go to war and getting people to sign petitions. And I put all this effort into it and darn it, they went to war anyway. Right. And, and how arrogant and how silly does that sound, right? I mean, a college student in Indiana. <laughs> I think I stop the war. So I uh, having some humility too. It's like, I have hopes that people will take this, this knowledge and this material and do something good with it. But in the end, I have no control over that. So I, 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 I someone taught me this phrase a long time ago to speak the truth as you see it. Yeah. And that's, that's really, I think all, all, we can do really.